Diversity, it might be what's holding your team back and you may not know it yet and may not know how to solve it. For that reason, I'm really excited to tell you that Data Futurology has established a partnership with She Loves Data and we're doing a series dedicated on improving diversity in your organization, in your teams, in your workplace, so you can get the most value out of your teams, out of your data and create products that the market really wants. Tune in every week as we speak with executives and female leaders from all over the world on how they have targeted and improved the diversity on their teams. And you can find out what we can learn from them. We are thrilled as a She Loves Data to be part of the Tough Futurology podcast, where we will showcase some female leaders, but the leaders from tech industry. And we will be talking about strategies, about data, about biases, and about diversity. Join us. I wanted to say a big thank you to our sponsors. One of our sponsors is Shine Solutions Group. Shine Solution Group is a technology consultancy that has been empowering their enterprise and government partners with pragmatic technology solutions for over 20 years. Learn more at shinesolutions.com. Also a big thank you to SAS, giving you the power to know. Through innovative software and services, SAS empowers and inspires data advocates around the world to transform data into intelligence. Committed to diversity, did you know about the Women in Analytics Network that they have? It's a SaaS-sponsored networking program aimed to strengthen diversity in the analytics field. Check it out in the show notes below. They're definitely committed to it as they are helping us with this diversity series too. I also would like to tell you about Growing Data. Growing Data is a consultancy that helps organizations unlock the full potential of their data they work with some of Australia's most successful organizations from finance. They work with people like ANZ Bank, through to biotechnology companies like CSL, and all the way to construction, working with companies like Metricon. They help these and many more companies solve their most challenging data-related problems in analytics, machine learning, data engineering, and data governance. While I was at ANZ Bank, I got the pleasure to work with the team at Growing Data, and I can tell you for a fact, they are top notch. I highly recommend Growing Data. Find out more at growingdata.com.au. Also a big thank you to Talent Insights. Talent Insights are Australia's leading data specialist recruitment business. They are experts in recruitment strategy and delivery for analytics and data teams. They are the go-to recruitment business for all your data roles in Australia, and they can help both with permanent hires and short-term project-focused data resources. I've used Talent Insights in the past, and I've always found them fantastic to work with. Visit them at talentinsights.com.au. Hi, this is Felipe Flores. Uh, welcome to another episode of Data Futurology in our partnership with She Loves Data. This is episode five of our series, uh, which we're calling She Leads. So hashtag She Leads, getting real about leading with diversity in data and obviously working closely with our partner, She Loves Data. The topic today is diversity and representation in AI. Joining me from She Loves Data is our co-host, Patricia Mulls, who is the Global Head of Partnerships. Welcome, Pat. How are you going today? I'm good, thank you. Happy to be back representing She Loves Data and obviously enjoying the collaboration. And really excited to talk to you and uh, our esteemed guest about one of my favorite topics in AI. It's amazing. We are so excited. Uh, today, we have Glenda Crisp, who is the Chief Data Officer and Executive for Enterprise Data and Architecture at the National Australia Bank. Uh, Glenda has a wealth of experience working in, in Canada for one of the largest banks in North America and coming over to, uh, to Australia about two and a half years ago, we were saying. So very excited to have Glenda on the show and obviously very excited that, that uh, you've come to Australia and that uh, you uh, have uh, built the, the capability at NAB um, in, in such an amazing way. Glenda, welcome and a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Good and thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to meet both of you. Incredible. So to, 
uh, to kick us off, Glenda, I wanted to ask you if you could give us a, a quick overview of, of your background and, and your origin story about how you got uh, interested and, and how you were pulled into the, the world of data, um, as well as how your, your career has, has taken shape uh, up to this point. Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting question when you think about when did you get into it. And for me, it was a long time ago. When I was at university, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was taking a Bachelor of Commerce and I found that I really loved the comm sci classes that I took as electives. So I really saw the potential in, in combining business and technology. Um, and I will say my favorite class was my econometrics course. I think there were like eight of us in the class. I was the only wow. girl. Um, <laughs> and it was combining economics and math and computers. And I loved that class. Um, on reflection, I probably should have done more in that space because it, uh, it certainly is feels like an early version of data science. Um, so I ended up with a Bachelor of Commerce. I majored in finance uh, with a minor in systems and I then started a career in technology. So I started out as a programmer at one of the big banks in Canada. I uh, did wow. that for a few years. Then I I uh, decided that when I looked around, most of the people getting promoted into senior levels had an MBA. So I went into the MBA. Um, and I actually, at that point, intended to go into banking, banking, like not back into technology. And I interviewed with the Canadian banks again. Uh, and I told them I wanted to be in their banking associate programs, but they all tried to get me into their tech departments. And I had just come oh. from so I kind of got pigeonholed back into technology. So I ended up working for Accenture for seven years because I figured if I was going to work in technology, I wanted to work on big strategic programs. Um, and following about seven years there, I ended up back at a, at a bank in their technology department. So I guess it was meant to be. Um, so I spent 17 years at TD Bank in Toronto and uh, did a range of things there starting out in the investment bank technology and then ending up in the, the corporate. So all the back office things. So anti-money laundering and finance and HR, uh, international and domestic payments. So like just a wide variety of, of capabilities and functions in the bank, which made for an interesting job. But I noticed that I seem to be collecting data from across the bank a lot. Like it's pretty much what I did on most of my projects. And so I felt like there had to be a better way than continually going and aggregating again and again and again. And so that's when I really started pushing into big data um, and started building out a lake at TD. Um, and then eventually I felt like I needed a bit of a change. So I went to be the chief data officer there um, and really focused on things like data quality and metadata and how that links and really enables things like analytics and AI. Um, and then I got recruited by NAB. And so um, the beauty of the role at NAB is uh, that I have both the business responsibility on data, so data governance and management, so things like uh, third-party data management, records management, but I also have the technology. So the new platforms we're building on the cloud, of course, I've also got the legacy platforms that I'm trying to turn off, but that ability to ring, really bring business and tech together again is, is what I really like. Um, and I just love being in the data space. So that's kind of how I, I got to here. And I love uh, Melbourne. I love it more when we're not in lockdown. Um, but uh, that's just the, the state of the, of the situation uh, during COVID. And I was I was going to ask you about the the differences between the the CIO role, so the chief information officer role that you had at TD, and then the the chief data officer role. You might have you might have touched on it um, about the the business versus technology um, ownership and and the combination of the two. But is is do you see that as the the main difference between between the roles and and was there any surprises when you when you went from from CIO to chief data officer? Um, yeah, so that actually is the difference. So I was one of the CIOs at TD and um, uh, very much focused on the technology, the applications, ensuring we have target state architectures. We're driving towards those. 
Um, there's a lot of data work in all of that because you're, you know, either aggregating data, converting data, moving data, um, those types of activities. Whereas the CDO role, at least as it was defined at TD at the time, was really around data governance, data management, uh, making sure that we identified our critical data elements, we measured them for quality, and it was really operating a, a small team cross border, so across US, Canada, and um, out through all the businesses to ensure that we really had a good grip on our data, understood our data risk and were managing it. Now the role here at NAB is different in that it puts both pieces together. Um, and that was what attracted me to the role because I found after two and a half years uh, on the so-called business side, I quite missed the technology side, I guess uh, I just can't get away from it. Um, and I, I really love building things and, you know, making things better. Um, and so it felt, uh, it felt like I was coming back to like bring all the pieces of my career together for this job. So I quite like that. Yeah, but that's the difference between CIO and CDO at TD. CDO here at NAB, I've got both pieces. Amazing. Truly, yeah, truly inspiring. And I can relate very much to the desire to, to build and combine business and technology. But Glenda, I want to ask you uh, about something else. Uh, we have a number of listeners from She Loves Data who are just beginning to get into this journey of data and technology. Knowing what you know now, what would you advise them or uh, an earlier version of yourself perhaps? Um, well, you know, one thing that I, I think has worked well for me and that I encourage others to do is to stay curious. Nothing moves faster than technology. Um, and just um, pay attention to the big themes that are going on, you know, across industry, not just within your own industry. And so for me, if I look back, like I started out on mainframe computers, right? I, and Apple, the original Mac was the very first uh, machine I ever coded on. And so that probably dates me, but, um, you know, it was, it's seeing the different shifts that have happened. So if I go back to about 2010, 2011, social was a really big uh, social media, social platforms, networking was a very big driver. And so one of the things that I worked on at TD was implementing an internal social networking system and really driving that out. Um, and so which kind of then also drives data Right. And so then it, it, I was always very curious about how to solve problems. And I think that staying curious and being open to doing things a different way um, allows you to kind of move into new spaces early. So, for example, when we started to build the lake um, at TD, it's not like there were a ton of people that knew Hadoop in the financial services environment. Mm -hmm. So I was able to come in, I had, you know, a lot of experience with data and with technology, but not Hadoop. And so I worked with people that had that experience and built it for myself. But because I could get in early, you know, and see it as a big trend, that then it allowed me to, to kind of get in on the ground floor and grow with the technology. If you kind of wait five years, then there's tons of experts, right? If you can get in early on some of these things and be curious about them, then you can be part of really that explosion that happens with new tech. Does that, so, does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. It's, it's more about growing with the, the technology and looking at solutions, as you mentioned. And this brings me to uh, a question that comes from our community often which is, do we absolutely need to have a tick list of all our the tech skills or, or even technologies uh, in order to go into certain jobs? And uh, I suspect you have a, a response to that, but I'd like to hear it uh, and, and perhaps share with the community. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that you need to have a, a tick list of, I mean, there's basic things that people are gonna look for and, and especially now, um, you know, I look for people that are starting to get certified on cloud, that they understand how to build APIs, 
you know, using whichever tack if they're in data science and looking at Python uh, for us, Jupyter Notebooks. But, you know, it, it also depends on kind of the job you're applying for and the level you're applying for. So if you're looking at an entry level candidate for an entry level role, uh, probably looking a lot at attitude and, um, you know, desire to learn, willingness to learn, willingness to try new things. Um, yes, you want some basic capability there. Like, I don't want to have to teach them how to code in Java. I would kind of expect that. Um, but if there's something new, I expect that they're going to be curious and they're going to want to learn it and, and maybe, you know, invest a bit of their time in it. Um, and certainly we've invested in three different guilds at NAB to kind of help upskill our whole uh, population. So we've got a cloud guild, um, which is, you know, Amazon, Azure, a little bit of Google, and then we've got an analytics guild and a data guild. And so um, I think, yes, eventually some jobs require very specific skills, um, but as you're looking to build your career, I don't think you need everything. And what I would say, especially for the She Loves Data crowd, is I, I think there has been research done that would show that women think they have to tick all the boxes on a job description, and you don't. So I will tell you as a person who's hired a lot of people over my career, I've never met a person that ticked every box, never. Some, everybody's got something that they don't have that's going to be a stretch. And actually, you want somebody that's going to grow in the job and take it somewhere else. And so, you know, don't feel like you have to tick every box. Make sure you've got a reasonable chunk of it and you can do the basics and that, you know, you can make a case for how you can apply some of your other skills to the role, but don't feel like you have to tick everything. Thank yes. you, Glenda. That's inspiring. That's so true. Um, that's great. And you you mentioned um, you mentioned the the three guilds, and you mentioned the responsibilities of of the cloud guild. But what's the difference between the responsibilities, obviously at a high level? But what's the difference between the responsibilities of the data guild and the analytics guild? Um, the data guild is really more oriented towards our data stewards. So things like data quality. What is a critical data element? What are the dimensions of data quality? Because it's not just a pass fail. There's multiple ways to consider quality. Um, how do you do metadata tagging? What does a good tag look like? Um, and we're starting to push into things like privacy. What are the privacy concerns you need to think about with the data? The uh, regulations we need to comply with across the bank. And uh, also starting to push in on records management and how to keep good, strong, secure records within the bank. So, you know, it's building those really strong data management, data governance disciplines. The analytics guild is the, um, is, you know, always the, the sexy one. So that's the one with the, you know, the Python, the, the R, the, you know, the, the machine learning, the best practices in data science. And so we have a really big community on the analytics and we have a pretty good sized community on data stewardship. So the data guild has about 500 people and then the analytics guild has about 2000. So it just gives right. you the relative size. Wow. Wow, and I've actually heard really good things about the the training that the the guilds have been have been uh, doing in inside of NAV. Um, there's a lot of people that have been really impressed with the with the efforts of the guilds. Um, so yeah, really really well done there. Um, I also wanted to ask you about about diversity and representation. I wanted to ask you both from from a from a NIB uh, NIB perspective and and from your own uh, personal perspective. What what does diversity and representation um, mean for uh, for the bank and and what does it mean for you? And what are the types of initiatives that are are being worked on around um, diversity and representation? Sure. Uh, happy to talk about this. I do think it is. And for us, we refer to it as inclusion and diversity because it's about creating that inclusive environment. Um, but we do have uh, our core purpose is to serve our customers well and to help our communities proper, uh, prosper. So like that's why we exist. So in order to do that and do it well, 
you actually need to reflect the community in which you operate, the customers that you serve. And so um, it's important to have that inclusive culture within the bank. And so we really look to value and respect the diversity of our people, our customers, our suppliers, communities, really. So it's, it's, it's really kind of a core part of who we are as a bank. Um, so we do have uh, an inclusion and diversity policy. We do have programs um, that we are, are working through, but we're looking to attract and retain. So that's kind of step one, attract and retain diverse uh, talent and ensure they're working in an inclusive environment. We want to ensure that um, everybody in the bank is empowered to work and grow together um, in, a, in a safe, you know, psychologically safe and a flexible way. Um, and we're looking to really leverage the diversity of the skills that, that we, we can find across the bank to drive a better customer experience. Um, and, and then finally supporting our communities. So we, we have had for the last several years a very large focus on gender balance. Um, however, we do actually drive across multiple pillars for inclusion and diversity. It's not just about gender. Um, and certainly that, um, that really resonates with me individually because I see diversity as a strength. Um, and so I tend to personally look for uh, people who think differently than me, because uh, I think we get to a better outcome when we do that. So within um, the space I'm in at, at NAB, so I'm in the technology and enterprise operations team, and, and we've got a little working group put together and we've got six pillars of, of inclusion that we're, we're targeting, um, gender balance. We've got something called NABility and neurodiversity. So really looking at, at different, uh, differently abled, I guess. Um, we've got NAB pride. We've got cultural inclusion, African inclusion, and Indigenous. So those are the six wow. pillars that we are going after. And for each one of them, we've said, you know, um, what, what do we want to do? How do we want to engage? How, like, are there any things we need to consider? How would we um, determine uh, what success would look like for us? Like, how do we actually move the dial on these things? What are some, you know, potential ways to recruit um, or retention activities that we need to do? So we've thought through each of those pillars. And so that's, um, that's something that I, I get pretty passionate about. So sorry, <laughs> I'm kind of uh, rambling here, but I think it's, it's critically important. Um, it is. It's really good. And, and, and it's great. It's great to, to hear and to feel the passion um, because it's, it's so, it's so important. I wanted to ask you about some of, some of the um, maybe metrics or approaches to, to inclusion Maybe, maybe it would be a more around the the retaining of the of the skill. Um, in in general, there's been a lot of discussion around around things like quotas, for example. And and um, I know that for, with with my wife, we've had a, a lot of discussions about about quotas. And and she's um she's she's definitely opened opened my my eyes in in, in terms of the benefits and the the help that they they can provide. How um, how does it work uh, in inside your organization around some of the ways that the, that the talent is, is retained when, um, uh, it, how is it uh, that the talent's being retained with a focus on, on inclusion and, and fostering the diversity? Well, I'll, I'll use one from gender balance, for example. So we're really uh, looking at uh, women in returning to the workforce, right? Mm -hmm. So we look to understand, are there any, uh, any blockers within our processes or our policies and then we we try to work with them to make sure that they are coming back and that you know we want them back and you try to stay in contact with them um, while they're on leave and just try to encourage that they return when they're ready right like it's not about rushing anybody but it is about making sure that people feel welcome back so that would be one way that we would look at at retention uh, for sure um, and then, you know, it's been interesting because um, I actually have uh, one of my 
architects and one of my data people, uh, a man and a woman, are actually co-leading on the gender balance thing. And so when we were talking about some of, of our ideas, um, we actually very, very quickly went to gender balance. And this works for men. Let's make sure our programs work for men and women. It's not just you know, necessarily for one part of the population. And so it's been really exciting to see the two of them work together on it. Um, and I think that's really how it should be viewed. I think, uh, I think everybody benefits from some of these things. And it's really just about how do we make everybody feel included? So that's, that's kind of the approach. And, and we continue to um, work on our, our training. We're implementing uh, more training at NAB around leadership, which I think will also help us build better leaders, which will ensure we've got that great culture that helps us retain people. That's great. That's, that's awesome. Uh, speaking as a woman, Glenda, I'm really, um, what you're doing at NAB is, is really laudable. It's, it's, I wish that there were more uh, companies that would adopt your practices especially post pandemic, as we know, most women, there were a lot more women impacted by the pandemic. So it's really nice to hear that. I would like to uh, ask you a, a bit about uh, algorithms and in AI, mm -hmm. perhaps it deviates a bit from, from this discussion, but algorithms and consequently AI being the human creations that they are, sometimes carry with them the biases, uh, whether consciously un or unconsciously of their creators, right? And it doesn't matter if, if it, whether you've got a diverse workforce, it's still essentially the person's um, internal principles and value systems will, will somehow reflect. When these biases uh, become somewhat problematic. How do you address, uh, how do you address them? Would you look at it against the lens of ethics or is it more of a governance or policy issue or both? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm gonna start with, I think building on something you said. So really AI learns from data. The historical data we have is a result of human decisions and humans are biased. So the answer is both. Um, math is math. Uh, we can't just, you know, ask AI, hey, be more fair. We actually need to prescribe math that is fair. So we really need to make sure we've got strong governance so that things can be challenged and queried at the start and then built, deployed and beyond, making sure that we look at the whole life cycle for bias. Um, and so I, I don't think I, I know of anybody that's intentionally trying to, you know, create course, something yeah. unethical. Um, and we've actually created a data science best practice um, with standard processes. And, and it includes things like, where do you start on a new project? How do uh, concurrently contribute to data science and analytics projects and which models are best suited to which types of problems because we're still building skill. Um, how do you actually ensure there's good data quality coming into your model? Um, but yeah, you do actually, when it comes to bias, you need to really actively look for it and actively manage it. Um, we have an ethical framework for the use of data, machine learning, and AI. Um, we're on our, we're just refreshing it now into our version two, but it includes concepts like fairness and transparency, respect, right? And so we do, um, before we do anything, we ask the should we question. Before you ask the can we technically do it, which most of us techies like to get into, we actually mm -hmm. wanna start with should we, should we do this? Right. And if we should do it, what are things we need to think about in terms of bias, potential bias that we should be calling out up front and then trying to actively manage through the process and not just doing it once at the start when you have the big idea, 
but you need to do it as you're going through development and then before you go into production. Because I think anybody that's written code knows that what you think you're going to build at the start and what you end up building at the end, there's a there's variation. And it's not like they're night and day, but there's variation. And so because of that variation, you need to do your checking on ethics and bias throughout the process. It can't just be done once. Does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as a follow-up, uh, who do you think in the company should be the... AI police, just in terms of accountability. Of course, ultimately, the, the entire organization should be made uh, you know, accountable as much as they can. But typically in organizations, who, who uh, upholds these ethical prin uh, principles and, and essentially governs over the entire AI checking process? Well, you know, it depends on every organization and what their structure is and what their culture is. Um, at NAB, I have accountability for the ethical framework around use of data, machine learning and AI. I mean, there's other ethical frameworks, you know, around lending, et cetera, but I have the responsibility for, for data. Um, and so I'm responsible for ensuring the right governance processes are in place around it. But we also have, um, and all banks have this, a model risk group who, who are assessing risk of models as well. So they're part of the process. So it's, it's not just us. Um, but really, there's a variety of stakeholders involved in this. Um, you've got your data scientists, you've got your ethics team, you've got the business teams that are trying to drive the outcome for the customer. Um, and, and I actually think, uh, having everybody kind of in the mix is really powerful and this, sorry to come back to it, but this is where diversity is critical, mm. um, because that diversity of thought and experience and skill really help to provide a good peer challenge on the models that you're building. Um, cause everybody looks at things slightly different and somebody's going to see an issue that somebody else won't see just because of the nature of their background or their experience. And so diversity really, I think, helps um, with that. So ultimately uh, at NAB, I, I have to make sure that we're, we're acting in the right way. Um, in terms of the customer outcome, my, my colleagues in the business teams are all accountable for those. Um, and so we work together on it. That's, that's okay. really great to hear because uh, in 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 some organizations, or sometimes sometimes the approach seems to be that it's it's all on the data scientist's shoulders, and and sometimes data scientists they they feel the pressure of the fact that you know their algorithms are making decisions at scale, hundreds of thousands of decisions, um, you know, in a day or in a month, and and that obviously no no human can can look at each one of those those decisions and that's that's one of the beauties of, of AI of decision making at scale but it comes with the, with the weight with the burden of of wow is this is this um being fair being ethical uh, is it free from bias for for the largest um number number of people and so it's, it's great to hear that it's it's a collaborative uh, approach that you guys have have um, developed and that you've established and that um you know that you get multiple multiple perspectives and it sounds like that that is the the focus during the development of of the algorithms um what what does it look like um when it goes into into production and and beyond what mm -hmm. what are some some ways to mitigate bi bias once the the models live sorry yeah, no, it's it's actually the full life of the model. I think like you can't actually, it's not just during dev, you've got to continue the monitoring of the model. So you, uh, the monitoring of the model isn't just about, um, you know, the, the business outcome piece. It's actually the model drift. Is it still doing what we expected it to do? Is it moving in ways that we don't want it to move? And then ethics comes into that as well. So we are looking at, are there ways for us to automate some of that monitoring and testing of our models? Um, yeah. And I would say, look, we're not, like we don't have tons and tons of models here. So we're, we're moving carefully uh, and slowly because we actually, before we go at pace on this stuff, we want to make sure that we've thought through these things and that we have the right governance and the right controls in place. Um, and so that's why 
the, the number of models that we would be running right now is relatively low, so we can keep an eye on them and, and be learning uh, and making sure that um, we're building our capability and including ethics as, as we're moving down this path. I think it's, it's, not, it's not that you should be afraid of the technology, but you should be cautious and careful uh, until you've got the skill and the comfort that you're managing it and, and its outcomes. And so that's where we're spending a fair amount of focus on what is the tooling that we can put in place to automate a lot of the governance and checking for things like bias. Yeah, that's great. And I think, you know, that's, that, that sounds like, like the right approach because this is a big problem, but also the, the, the tools around ethical AI, uh, from a technical perspective, the, the technical tools are quite new, and and um, and especially for for the the scale that you would need um, to hit for an organization uh, like NAB is is huge. So it's it's I'm sure it's it's comforting to to the customers that that you are being that you're being thorough um, thorough with with um, with bias and and ethical AI. Yeah. And we're also, um, so the, the Australian government's been running a, a pilot process on AI um, ethics. And so we've embedded that within our program so that we're kind of working with the industry. We're learning from others that may not be in banking. Um, and so I think um, this is an area where everybody's going to need to continue to evolve over the coming years. It's not like anybody I think is, you know, perfect at it yet. Uh, even the companies that are way out in front are still learning and growing. And so I'm, I, whenever I talk to anybody's data science team, I'm asking them about their ethical framework and how they've done it and what they've done and what they've automated and how they manage bias. So, um, I think they know because they never seem too shocked when they see me coming with those questions. So <laughs> I must be getting I, information. <laughs> I totally, I totally agree. Um, I, I work in a, in a healthcare AI company and, um, and it's, it's a, it's a relatively new company and, um, and we, we set our, uh, our model governance framework uh, a, a few months ago and, and it was also setting a lot of processes and, and what we thought are, are all, as a high bar for for model uh, governance and explainability, and to um, mm -hmm. to make sure that the, the bias is is removed as much as possible. And there's been um, there's been cases in in the U.S. where um, access to healthcare, um, they, they're, this access to healthcare is driven by the cost, and then the the cost is a proxy for socioeconomic indicators. So then that bias goes into the model, but then the model recommends that people that have higher socioeconomic status get access to the best access, uh, access the best healthcare, and people from low socioeconomic status access lower healthcare. That's a recommendation of the algorithm because that's the bias in society at the moment. But we have to be really careful that as we you know, democratize access to healthcare. We're using digital tools and, and AI. We want to create the world that we want to live in, not right. not continue to um, to perpetuate the world that, that we have when we have the the opportunity to make something something better. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a tall a tall order. So, um, it's great yeah. to hear that you guys are working on it. Yeah, like it's it's a journey, right? Like we've got a long way to go. My team's got lots of really good ideas and we just keep building and keep improving. Yep. Always open to new ideas. If anybody's got a, a really great silver bullet, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that. Um, yeah, that, that might be still be coming the, the silver bullet. There's um, there's there's a lot. There's a lot there. Yeah, just a, as a follow-up to the last discussion, uh, I read that last year the G20 actually got together and came up with this uh, AI principles uh, document or something like that. Uh, how do you incorporate all of these global recommendations and, and to what extent do you adopt them and, and to what extent do you uh, customize your your own uh, suggestions for for an ethical AI frame, framework. Sorry, 
Um, look, we're, we're constantly paying attention to what's going on uh, outside our company and outside our country. So we, we are very open to seeing how others are viewing them. I think every company needs to then take it internally and think, what does this mean for our customer? How does this apply? Um, and then the other piece of advice that we were given when uh, we were creating our first version was to try and keep the language as closely linked to the values of the company as possible because we train our employees on our values and here's what matters. And so it, the closer they are linked to that, the easier it is for people to kind of uh, stay with them. Like, so they op our framework acts as guardrails. And so the more I can link up to those types of concepts and words, the easier it is for everybody to remember them. So they're not remembering multiple frameworks, they remember respect, right? So it's, it's, um, I think it's incumbent on every company to figure out what's right for them and their customer base and the services they provide because things are obviously different for pharma than they are for banks, than they are for, you know, grocery stores. So we all serve different needs and there's different expectations from the consumers on us. So that's kind of how I, I view it, but I absolutely like to stay on top of what others are thinking and doing. So it's helpful to see if I've missed something. Is there a gap in our framework? Um, has somebody stated it more clearly than we have? And, and maybe I could, you know, lift a bit. <laughs> so it's, it's really, I'm always fascinated to see how others articulate it, um, to see if there's a better way to get it across to somebody who's not technical. Yeah, I definitely agree with what you said about translating a company's brand values into uh, action, actually. And, and, and this will certainly reflect in your AI framework. Uh, yeah, so, so that, that's really great to hear. Good. And um, I think you had a, a question about um, some of the groups Pat, I think you had a question for, oh, yeah. uh, for Glenda. Yeah that's, yeah, that's right. Uh, Glenda, you mentioned earlier that you had some initiatives at uh, NAB uh, that involve uh, women. Can you, can you please share any stories of, of how these initiatives have impacted women's careers? Uh, sure. Um, so we've, we've done a variety of things at varying, if, if you think about it, age groups. So we, we've done and partnered with some community groups around girls learning to code, um, because obviously those of us women that are in technology really want to encourage the future generation. Um, and so we, we get involved in several of our senior managers get pretty uh, deep in there and they participate in, in those events. And I've spoken at a few events when we were allowed to have events. <laughs> and so uh, I think right now we're kind of trying to figure out how to do some of these things that we used to do in a, in a COVID world. So doing more virtual meetings, et cetera. Um, but we are also, uh, you know, within uh, the bank, we have a, a program that we've used for uh, women that are kind of on the cusp of being a manager. And, and it gave them the opportunity to go around the bank and talk to senior executives, find out what their career path was, ask just general questions about the bank. Um, and we found that group and, and it, it took them through a thought process on what are their career goals? What is it that, how would they define success? you know, what are the types of careers within the bank that they would be interested in? Because banks are very large entities with lots of different functions and you can really do a lot of different things within one company. Um, and so we found that program was quite helpful in helping women to really refine their thinking. And then many of them actually progressed and they were more deliberate about which jobs they went for. Um, and, and many of them were promoted uh, post that program. So. Uh, essentially because they started to apply for the more senior roles and because they were more educated and they understood the, bit, the business better, they were able to um, really make their case for why they'd be a good fit in the role. But those that's, are that's the really, things that we do. Yeah. That, that's really great to hear. Um, 
According to MIT Sloan, to only 22% of AI practitioners so far are, are women. And obviously, being somewhat at the top of your game, belonging to this, uh, well, some, this elite group, uh, you have, I'm sure, gone through your share of challenges, uh, right? Would you care to share some of those stories about how it was being one of the few women in the room or in the boardroom, uh, in the classroom or the boardroom, how, how, how has it been for you? And again, what would you tell uh, our listeners who are interested in, in, in essentially going through the same path that you have carved out for yourself? Well, I think the first thing I would say is uh, I started my career decades ago. So my path is, is going to be my path and your path will be your path. So um, I always think it's important that everybody define success for themselves. Uh, and then don't waste your energy comparing yourself to others. Just make sure that you're enjoying your career. Um, but don't let fear hold you back. Um, make sure that you understand why you're not putting your name forward. And sometimes people are just afraid that, that they won't get the job, but it's always good to put your name forward. You learn something, you make a connection and you may get a different role. There may be another opportunity that comes up. Um, but for me, um, yes, there's been many cases where I was the only woman on the team. Um, and, and to be honest, um, I think I got used to it. Uh, and, you know, like I talked about being in university and I was like 19 in my econometrics class and I was the only girl and I was so used to uh, being in classes with few women in university that for the, me, the workforce didn't feel that different. And I have a lot of friends in, with the guys I work with. Um, and I've also been fortunate enough to work for bosses that have always supported me. They've made training available to me. I've worked for great companies that have invested in me and I've just taken all those opportunities. Um, I do think, um, I do think as women, uh, and the one thing, and this probably isn't a complete answer to your question, but it's the one thing that I always say to young women when I get a chance is please don't be complacent. When I graduated from my undergrad, my BCom, like half of us were women. And I thought 30 years on, there wouldn't be a problem. I thought half of senior executives would be women because it was just the law of numbers. We now all were graduating. We had university degrees. We were all going out and having these great careers. And I just assumed, right, that this was going to happen. And so when I, you know, especially when I talk to millennial women and they're like, yeah, yeah, Glenda, but it's different for us. And I'm like, what you're saying is what I said 30 years ago. So please don't be complacent. Please reach sideways, reach backwards, reach forward, help other women, help them, right? Like, and, and you know, I think technology is an amazing career and data science, like I said, it didn't exist when I went to university. Um, and, you know, a lot like what I do right now didn't exist when I went to university. So that stay curious, don't be complacent, but I think, you've really got to um, speak up and, you know, watch, watch for unconscious bias, watch for, um, just watch for the inequities and not just about gender, but all diversity and inclusion, watch for those things and, and speak up and, and help to lead in a different way. And so I think that's, that's kind of what I would say, but please, please don't be complacent. <laughs> I love that's, that. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. And what, what, one of the things that, um, that I love about your approach, Glenda, is the, the breadth of uh, diversity and inclusion to, to you know, physically abled, uh, different, different races, different gender. That's, that's, that's incredible. And, and I find that those are the types of conversations and the types of approaches that, that we need in society to, to make things more equal to to get closer to uh, for us to have the the world that you are uh, thinking that that we would have you know when you were finishing university and I definitely find that as a as a man it those conversations are are really helpful not only not only to 
to uh, discover blind spot and, 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 and blind spots that men could have do have and and to continue to to eradicate those but also I find that as a as a man there's a lot of maybe unspoken pressures in the in the gender roles that I think that these type of discussions are, are helping um, helping us speak up about the the things that maybe we as men that we feel like we got stuck with that maybe we don't want as as much and in 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 the last for example in my case in the last couple of years become i became a parent i have two kids now and and i i have seen myself feel kind of like the pressure of being the the provider um, when I would love to spend more time with my kids and, and be able to, for example, access part-time work uh, in, in, a way, in, in a way that's more easy. Um, and my wife is on the flip side. Uh, she's at the moment looking after a two-month-old uh, and a two-year-old, and she wants to go back to work also part-time. And I, I would love to, and that's what I see, uh, one of the huge benefits of the approach that you have is that, you know, you're moving us closer to a world where both my wife and I can work part-time and we can, and we can have that, that family life. Um, how, how, yeah. How is this in line with your thinking? How, how important is this for you? Like, I think, um, look, I think everybody's different and is motivated differently. And I, I don't, I don't think it has to be a gender thing. Like it, I, I think, um, you know, couples work out for themselves what works and and what each one wants and, and it can differ. And I, you know, so I still always come back to define success for yourself, right? Um, and what does that look like for you and, and your family? Um, but allow that to change over time. Yeah. Because, like what's important to you in your 20s is probably not as important in your 40s. Right. And it's just, it's different. Uh, and you're at a different stage in your life. And so it's always good to kind of check in and say, you know, what's working, what's not working. What, what do I, what do I really enjoy doing? Um, and, and reassess and, and take course corrections. And I don't really think like careers go for decades. They're decades long. So, you know, don't feel like you have to rush through it. Don't, you know, look for opportunities to move laterally and try different things. It all is experience. It's all going to help build a more rounded, a more developed person, both personally and professionally. And so, um, you know, I oftentimes have people come and talk to me about, oh, I want to get promoted. I want to be an executive. And I'll say, that's nice. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> well, and, and I'll say, well, that, that's nice, but... Like, but what do you want to do? Like, what's mm -hmm. the work you want to do? Because titles are lovely. But frankly, if you hate your job, it doesn't matter what your title is. You still don't want to get out of bed. So it doesn't matter if you've got, you know, the best title in the world. If you don't like the work you do, um, then it's it, like there's, there's no point to it. So think more about individually what satisfies you. Absolutely. Uh yeah, just, just to share uh, a bit about what we were doing at She Loves Data that resonates with that. So we were running a survey uh, post-COVID on career aspirations of women, asking them, so, so now that COVID happened, uh, are you still hopeful? Do you still want to shift jobs? Do you still want a new job? And interestingly enough, what came what came as the top reason for them wanting to change their situation is not that they want to earn more, though it's in the top three. Yeah. But so far, the, win the clear winner is, I want a more fulfilling uh, job. So there you go. It, it really uh, coincides with what you just uh, remarked on. Yeah. I think, I think honestly, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's something that was invented for millennials, frankly. I think most of us want purpose in our roles and in our jobs, and we want to feel like we're making a difference and we're making an impact, and there's different ways to do that. Um, and, you know, I think the beauty of having different people is they're good at different things, and if we were all good at the same thing, it would be really, really boring, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I agree. But that's that's um, excellent advice to to go and 
and try try different things and and make sure that you're um, optimizing and maximizing for, for fulfillment, for meaning, um, for a meaningful career, and for the contribution that you can make. And um, oh, it's 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 very apparent that that's uh, that that's the way that you've crafted your your career. So that's that's amazing. Um, that's amazing advice and and a great note to to end on as well. And Glenda, I wanna I wanna thank you so much uh, for for sharing your journey, your your insights, uh, your perspectives, and all all the the great work that you're doing. That is um so so very needed, and uh, you're definitely leading leading the charge. So thank you so much for all the work that you do and for spending some time some time with us today. Well, thank you both for having me. It was a great conversation. I look forward to listening to the rest of your podcasts. Thank you.